have massive amounts of data you need to work with, unsure how you can ingest, how you can transform it, how you can load them all inside of Azure, no matter where the data comes from, no matter what form it's in, Azure Data Factory is the solution. I'm gonna tell you all about it, coming up now. Hello everybody, my name is Adam Gordon. Welcome back to another exciting episode of What is Azure? In this episode, we're gonna tell you about what is the Azure Data Factory service. And of course, as always, we're gonna answer our famous three questions. What is the service or feature of functionality? Why would your company wanna use it? What's the business proposition and the value that it provides to you potentially? And of course, equally importantly, how do we actually get this thing deployed, stand it up and put it to work for you? Let's begin by jumping in and talk a little bit about what Azure Data Factory is. And of course, as a result of that, what it is you can do with this particular service. Now you can see on the light board in front of me, got an interesting diagram. And <clears throat> when we look at this end to end, what we're starting with over here is the database that we're gonna use that's linked to ultimately a cloud-based instance of our data. But what happens in the middle right here between the two is actually the magic that the Azure Data Factory provides. Now, our on-premises database, this is a Microsoft SQL database, or for that matter, could be any kind of database actually, is gonna provide the beginning information, the ingredients that allow us to actually use the Data Factory to do very important things. And specifically, in the language of data and data management, it lets us do one of two things. We can either do what's called ETL, Extract, Transform, and Load, or we could do a derivative of that, what's called ELT, Extract, Load, and Transform. And what that means is ultimately, and we're gonna put ETL or ELT right over here, just so that we can kind of keep track of that logic and see these as basically things that we're gonna engage in or activities that we're gonna do targeted at our data. What we're gonna do is take the data sitting in this database in whatever format it is and allow it to be moved through what you see in the middle here, this pipeline. And this pipeline represents one of the key important elements of what the data factory does for us. It creates connections and allows us to bundle together activities, transformative activities represented by the gears that work on our data in various forms represented by our grid and our data over here on the left. And although it's a little hard to see, transformed by a different color on the right as it moves through the pipeline, and then ultimately gets repositioned in our database that's gonna live in the cloud where we can then consume it, work with it, and do a variety of things on it. And the extract, the E in extract, transform, and load, is about pulling something out, pulling our data out of the database and making it into and available into a form that we can operate on. And then transform the T in the transform, or rather the T in the ETL, the extract, transform, and load, is gonna let us somehow manipulate and change that data from green to orange and through the processes represented by the gears, make it into something typically by moving, manipulating, modifying format, form, and function that we could then use in other places. And our L for load is gonna represent our ability to make that data available in a consumable format at the end of that process or the end of that pipe that allows us then to make it available, expose it, and of course, make it consumable. And so ETL, Extract, Transform, and Load, or ELT, Extract, Load, and Transform, whatever order we do them in, are really gonna be the key activities that the data factory brings to bear for us. So it's gonna be a process-driven thought capability or a solution, uh, a function in Azure that allows us to bundle together in one place all of these activities and allows us to very easily lay them out, set them up, configure them, and of course, consume them once we're done. Now, interestingly, how we consume them is not gonna be a focus of this episode, but we've done another episode in the What is Azure series on the Azure DevOps platform and the capabilities. And believe it or not, the way we link Azure Data Factory and tend to consume the output, in other words, what happens when we get over here is that this pipe, this pipeline and other pipelines like it are associated with an Azure DevOps instance. And so if you wanna see what the Azure DevOps piece is all about, take a look at that episode in the series. You'll see me explain the Azure DevOps capabilities and show you the different platforms as well as the dedicated portal 
that we can manage it through. And one of the aspects I touch on briefly there when we set it up, when we answer the question, how does it work, is the use of pipelines. And this will be a great example of one of the pipelines we could create tying the data factory into the Azure DevOps capability. So just a little extra added bonus there for you. But when we think about the what, we're thinking about a solution that allows us to take data that's on premises in a variety of formats and through a transformative series of events, manipulate it, modify it, and ultimately change it so it could be loaded and made available in a standardized solution that allows our services to expose and then analyze and ultimately visualize and consume that data in a variety of ways that customers, both internal and external, can benefit from. So that's really what the what is. Let's talk about the why. Why would a business want to use this? Well, let's think about a common business case that a large organization, perhaps your organization, may actually have and a problem you have to solve. Let's say that this data that's been sitting here that we haven't really given a name to or thought about is not just any kind of data, but it's data from all of our customers and their interactions with us as they buy and consume goods and services on our website. Or if you don't like that particular scenario, maybe this is data from patients in a medical practice. Got to apply a little bit more security, a concern about privacy to it, but still we could easily use this process to do the same thing I'm about to describe. Maybe we're in the gaming industry and maybe this is all of the data from all of the player sessions and all the logs of all the games that have been spun up by our customers on our platform. And we want to be able to take that and run it through some sort of pipeline and standardize and transform it and load it into an Azure SQL database that's going to be a data warehouse, known as the DW down here, data warehouse that's then going to allow us to expose that data and make it consumable through complex analytics, business intelligence, machine learning, and provide insights into our customer profiles and maybe find upsell opportunities, maybe find additional issues and concerns that we want to address for those customers by adding value and creating new features. Any and all these things can be done as a result of using a data factory and pipelines to consume that data, standardize it, and then expose it for analysis. And so any of these scenarios, whether they're medical patients, whether they're customers in a retail space, whether they're gamers on a platform, are going to provide huge amounts of raw data, but it's going to be in unstructured different formats. We need to standardize it. We need to move it from where it is into the pipeline, load it as we extract it. So the extract, the E, will take place over here. The load will take place here. And then we're going to start transforming it. And so this will be the T, right? The transform is going to be these gears doing stuff for us. And then over here, we're going to be able to take that data as it is transformed and move it into one or more structures that are going to allow us to work with it online in a variety of formats, loading it, standardizing it, and making it available for us. This is the value proposition that really helps us to frame the answer to the question, why would you want to use it? Any of these large scale data solutions are going to require this kind of capability to make sense of. And ultimately, if your business falls into this category, Data Factory may be the answer to that question. How do we work with our data? And more importantly, how do we standardize it and understand it? In order to take a look at how this actually takes place and what we do in order to stand it up, we're going to take one of those magic field trips we always talk about doing. We're going to transport ourselves over to the studio. I'm going to show you how to set up a data factory instance, and we're going to explain the logic of how this all comes together. All right, everybody. So now let's answer the how question. How do we actually get this data factory thing set up? I'm in the Azure portal, and we're going to begin our journey here. We're going to be on the home blade. We can actually go and search in the marketplace under all services, or if you've already used the data factory, so I'm going to zoom in and show you, and you've searched for it recently, it may very well be in your shortcut list, but if not, go to the search bar right up top, start typing data factories. You'll see that icon pop up. We're going to click there to be able to load the data factory area. When we do that, I'm going to have a data factory that's already been created, as you can see, the AZ09 data factory. It's a version two data factory, newer version. Uh, but for you, if this is the first time you're doing this, that will be blank, and you'll be invited to create one using the Create button right there or the Create button in blue that shows up in the middle of the screen. Now, for purposes of time, I've created a data factory. I'm going to quickly show you what the wizard looks like. We're not going to bother going all the way through it. I then want to click into the existing data factory, show you there's really not much we can do directly in this part of the portal, but we have a link to a very important tool, which is the design studio for the data factory, where we actually build all of those pipes, 
build all of those extract transform capabilities that we were talking about at the light board so we could begin to really automate and extend our capabilities using the data factory tool set. So let's get started. We're gonna go ahead and create. When I click on that, we get our create data factory fly out. We've got some little questions we're gonna be asked by section here, basics, git configuration, which we can do now or opt to do after we set it up. Networking advanced and then we review and create. This is a pretty standard wizard in the sense that most of the things we're probably used to having to provide are gonna be here. Let's just center that. You'll see we have to provide our subscription, a resource group. If we don't have one, we're invited to create a new one. We have to provide instance details where in the Azure Fabric globally we wanna host our data, our data factory instance, the name and our version. That's the V1, V2 that I was talking about. V2 provides some additional capabilities V1 is just an older version. If you're not sure, go with V2. It'll make your life a lot easier. We can click through on the bottom to navigate or we can click through the tabs as we go. On the Git configuration area, we have to go ahead and configure either a Git repository or the Azure DevOps capability that I spoke about when we were talking about the what and the why. And I said, you know, we can link this to an Azure DevOps instance. And I'm gonna show you the DevOps portal to show you where we get the information we need if we do the DevOps instance. Our DevOps account, project name, repo name, branch, and root folder, if we are going to be doing this and or the equivalent information for our GitHub instance, you'll see we change that just a little bit. This has to be legitimate GitHub or Dev uh, Azure DevOps instance information. So you need that account information. If you don't have it, or you just want to set it up later, just check the box and we'll provide it through the Data Studio. Once we get it set up, we'll be able to provide that configuration after the fact. Now, if I want to use the Azure DevOps instance, I could go to my DevOps portal. I can figure out based on that what my account is. The highlighted account is the one I would use. If I have a project, in this case, the AZ DevOps One project, I would need the name of that to be able to configure against. So I would get this information from my Azure DevOps, uh, either administrator or somebody in the DevOps team that has control of and access to this project in the portal. Get that information. I can transfer it right back over here. That was the DevOps Studio, by the way, where we do our design. And I could just simply populate this, right? Or I can opt out and do it later. Networking, I would have to decide how I wanna manage my virtual networks and or whether I wanna set up a public or private endpoint for connectivity. Public endpoint will be available to anybody that can see it, resolve it using a public IP address. Private endpoint would be internal, only available to consumers of the service that know how to find it through the VNet, the virtual network it's attached to inside Azure. So I just have to be aware of that and think about that and obviously make choices accordingly. And then under advanced, I have the ability to specify encryption and how I want encryption to be configured for my data. Microsoft encrypts the data by default, and Microsoft does what's called Microsoft Managed Keying or Provider Managed Key, PMK, but I can enable encryption using what's called a CMK solution, Customer Managed Keying, where myself, let's say hypothetically, is the customer or the tenant that owns the data and owns the data factory instance, will take on the responsibility of setting up and managing those encryption keys. So if I check that box off, I have to provide some additional information. Specifically, I need the key vault URL. This could be a key vault in Azure, by the way, and or, uh, not and or, and I should say, a user assigned identity for the encryption. So I could specify and we'll need to specify both of those. And then I can go ahead and when I'm ready, review and create. Now, clearly I haven't provided any information, so this is not going to validate out, but that's okay. You've seen the logic of what we would do. I've done all that to configure my existing instance. Let's just click through there and we can see that this has been set up. It is successful. It's hosted in the West US. It's uh, assigned to my subscription. It's a version two data factory. All the basics are there and there's not a lot I can do here. I said this is really like a shell and a placeholder object inside of Azure directly. I do have activity logs. I have access control capabilities to control who gets in here. I can modify some of the settings that I would have configured with the wizard, the networking, the managed identities, look at the basic properties. I can lock the resource if I want to prevent people from inadvertently removing it or modifying it. I can monitor it. 
And I have an automation capability to control and set up some very basic tasks. Really, it's just notification on billing. You see, I've built out a task and scheduled it to do that, but that's it. The real big important thing that I do here is not set up all the activities that I talked about as we answered the what and the why here, but rather I connect to the thing that I mentioned, which is gonna be the Azure Data Factory Studio. And I have a link for it right here. When I click there, what I am doing is opening a separate portal and we can see the portal right here. It is the Azure Data Factory portal. Notice the URL is different, ADF, azuredatafactory.azure.com. And I can then set up my code repository if I opted out of the Git repository or Azure DevOps capabilities and the setup in the wizard. I'm prompted to set it up and authenticate it here. So I can do that right from here. And then you'll see right down below here, I can go in and following the prompts and the easily clickable objects, I can ingest, I can bring copy in, uh, or rather bring copy, I can copy data and bring it in at scale or uh, automate that on schedule. I could orchestrate to set up pipelines, but without a lot of code. I could transform, there's the T right in our ETL, and I can configure SQL Server uh, services like SQL Server uh, services that allow us to do analytics and or to do data management, a variety of things. And I can do integration, SSIS's integration services to be able to run that integration and ultimately load that data into my target Azure data instance, in this case, an Azure SQL database. So I could do all that right from here. I can monitor, although I don't have anything currently going on with pipelines, but once those pipelines are set up, connected to Git and or to the DevOps instance, I can monitor them from here. I can interact with them. You'll see that I can set them up, see when they run. I can look at the triggering events. I can look at integration and I can look at data flow and debug it if necessary. So I can get a lot of metrics and actionable data from here. And I can manage all the different aspects of all the capabilities, the link services, the integration runtimes. I can look at the ability to work with either Git as the Git configuration we would set up. I can automate with ARM templates and I can look at security down here. All the things we set up in the wizard are all available right here that I can work with. And once I've set all this up, if I'm targeting my Azure DevOps instance, I can actually then bring these pipelines in and I can create the other connection, the other side of them, which is to come in over here and I can actually go into my project and I can have my pipelines set up and point that other end of the pipeline from that actual data factory right here, bring them in and tie them into Azure DevOps and use the DevOps fabric to be able to create those automations and create an end-to-end -end solution that allows me not only to monitor, but to extract, transform, and load, as well as then work with that data and create projects around it. So I can bring two services together by using these capabilities if I choose to. So this is a high-level overview of what we can do with Azure Data Fabric, but of course, da Azure Data Factory, excuse me, but of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. And although this particular solution may involve integration of a lot of moving parts, we talk about how to do all this kind of stuff and a whole bunch more over at IT Pro TV. You can always join me over there if you want to follow up on this little tidbit of information, this bite-sized nugget of knowledge around how you can better use and utilize Azure and all the services and capabilities associated with it to drive value in your organization, but also to understand just what the heck is Azure and what can you do with it. Until next time, I'm going to wish you happy Azuring, good luck integrating, and of course, make sure you check us out and let me have the opportunity to spend more time with you and teach you all about all the cool things you can do beyond what we do here. I'll see you soon, everybody. Take care.